Looking forward to hearing David Schroeder, our dear friend and fellow Catholic. He steps up. He is a clinical and spiritual social worker, worker and professional life coach. He has 30 years of experience in the human development fields and in his private practice, Transition Pathways. David offers a variety of techniques to assist individuals, couples, and groups in finding healthy pathways to love, higher awareness, and greater potential. He conducts workshops and retreats on topics such as Just Be Love, The Soul's Journey, Spirituality and Self-Esteem, The Path to Consciousness, Conscious Relationships, and The Power of Being. He's also a great author as well, Just Be Love, Messages on the Spiritual and Human Journey, as that's available for you to purchase as well. Nice topic tonight, as always, with David. Stand like a mountain, flow like water, seven traits to cope with change. So I'm going to offer you seven traits to coping with change. And uh, anybody experiencing any change these days in life of any sorts? So the... Uh, Change is very much a part of our life. We're always changing. The universe is always creating, expanding, and renewing. So since we are part of the universe, we are always creating, expanding, and renewing as well. Yet the world uh, has experienced, especially in these past two or three years, significant change and upheaval in pretty much all aspects of our lives. And as I've studied the ancients and the study, the study the cycles of time and the, the great cycle of the 26,000 year recession of the equinox, like I say to people, you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, and so to me, these seven traits are going to become even more crucial in the days and the years ahead. I'll just highlight one chain that's, that's happening on the earth. Imagine, and this isn't meant to scare us because this has happened four times on the planet already in terms of the, the past four world ages. But within the next 50 to 60 years, the ice caps on the planet will be gone. And so imagine the sea level rises around 200 feet. Um, and that will in itself create unprecedented change on the planet. <clears throat> so both on a, on a global and a galactic level, we're experiencing change. And there was a, uh, there was a sound healer uh, and shaman, I believe he's got a lot of shaman characteristics and um, he has a very angelic voice and he, one of the ways he heals or helps heal people is to his angelic voice. His name is Tom Kenyon. And he's been channeling for years the Hathors. And a number of years ago, he, in one of his channel, uh, channeling with the Hathors, they mentioned the idea of chaotic nodes. And a node is a intersecting point where two pathways, if you will, kind of intersect. And it's an interesting notion that the Hathors offered a number of years ago because it seems we are in the midst of ever increasing chaos and so these chaotic nodes seem to be becoming our current reality in 1970 there was a book written by um, the futurist alvin tofer future shock and that title Future Shop describes the psychological state of individuals and entire societies, what they experience when there's too much, their personal perception, they're perceiving too much change in too short of a period of time. And as the frequency and vibration of the planet increases from the core of the earth, as well as frequencies and the vibration we're experiencing on a galactic level that's coming to the planet. As frequency increases, it seems that time and life in general speeds up. So here we are 50 years later from when that book was published. 
And I believe his truth of that future shock is hitting society in our face right now. And we're on this accelerated track of collective and personal transformation. And so we're on the edge of shifting realities of what was true in these old energies and ways and what is coming to be in the days and weeks, years ahead. <clears throat> and the roots of the word trans and formation mean beyond form. So indeed, the structures of our societies, of our institutions, of our personal relationships with each other and ourselves, and even the relationship and the knowing of God is transforming before our eyes in real time. As the world and life changes, and it does, it can't be stopped. It's important to understand how to address and adapt to the ever increasing changes. So I'm going to offer you seven traits that the research has found over the years that to have any one or all, all seven of these traits is very important in terms of how people move through and more importantly adapt to changes. The first trait is resourcefulness. It seems that resourceful people um, are effective in using resources. And they have a habit of developing plans and contingencies with those resources. And they often see more than one way to solve a problem or to achieve a goal. They have a talent and a knack and they, they have a strong desire to find a new way to, to solve a problem. The phrase, think out of the box, applies to those types of people. Let's go back a few years to the childhood story that we all grew up with of the three little pigs. The first two pigs, they loved to sing and dance and play. They just wanted joy. So when they were going to build their house, the first pig, he built his house out of straw. It was a quick and easy job and he was done in no time. And he was all ready to sing and dance and play. And his brother with the same mindset, he took it a step further built the house a little stronger out of sticks. But he too in no time was ready to sing and dance and play with his brother. And so those two little pigs are what I would call living the spiritual bypass. They're looking to take the quick and easy way out of life and not thinking cause and effect, not thinking of consequences of that quick and easy way because they want the immediate gratification. So the third little pig is building his house of brick and mortar. And when the big bad wolf showed up at the first pig with his house of straw, it just took one huff and puff and he blew that house down. And of course that pig then ran to his brother's house, the house of sticks, the two of them are in that house and the big bad wolf shows up. He huffs and puffs, not once, but twice now, because that house is a, it's a little stronger, a little more sturdy. But it didn't take much for that house to be blown down as well. And so they scurry to the third brother that had built his house of brick and mortar. And he told them patience and perseverance, building the strong foundation is important to weather the storms of life. And the big red, bad wolf showed up with the three of them in his house of brick and mortar and he huffed and puffed and he couldn't blow it down. The only thing that fell down was his, his britches. So the reason I share that story is the importance of not just taking the quick 
an easy way out. Allow ourselves to be resourceful and patient in order to persevere. That's part of being the mountain. It stands firm, resilient, confident. The second trait is optimism. Can I see the glass half full, not so much half empty? Optimism is directly related to effective ability to not just be ready for change, but more importantly, to, to adapt to the changes. The optimist sees the possibilities and the opportunities, and they trust and believe that things will work out for the best. And they can consider and allow possibilities above and beyond what they've created. In much of my work with people over the years, that's a big key to getting from point A to point B and resolving whatever issues you might be confronted with. Can I allow for possibilities above and beyond what I've created? And in that passage of the way of mastery, it all resonates with your thoughts and your perceptions and ultimately your beliefs because that's what creates that ripple in the pond and what you throw in the pond will come back to you as your experience positive or negative so we are the creators of our experiences good bad or ugly the third trait is to be adventurous and there's two main ingredients that capture an adventurous spirit. The willingness to take risks and the desire to step into our unknown. No, not that. Many people do not like to take risks. They want the comfort and the safety zone, the familiar. And many people struggle with the unknown. It's interesting because I wrote a poem a number of years ago about love is found in the unknown as much as the known. And it seems that the clues to our life and the higher knowing of ourselves and love and God for that matter are found much more in the unknown than the known. So the adventurous person loves to take risks and they're okay with the unknown. Because the only way I make something unknown into the known is when I step into it. And since change involves both risk and the unknown, adventurous people usually perform well and they thrive in times of uncertainty. We realize folks, that there's no growth, there's no actualization in the familiar, in the comfort or the safety zone. That is all ego, that is all fear. There's two ways to address fear. I can see it as false evidence appearing real, or I can see it as feeling excited and ready. And the adventurous person is kind of like, I would see them as the noble warrior. They feel the fear, but they do it anyways, whatever it is. The next trait is adaptability. And adaptability consists of two main elements, flexibility and resilience. The flexible person they have dreams and goals like everybody else, yet they're not overly invested in them. They don't get too defined or detached by them. And when something doesn't quite work out, they say, oh, okay, let's go to plan B, maybe even plan C. So they're flexible, they're adapting, and that's the water 
the water is flexible, adapting. It adjusts to the barriers and the obstacles that might get in its way because it wants to get, the water wants to get to the ocean. And so there's stand, flow like water. The other part of adaptability is the resilience. The ability to bounce back rather quickly from adversity and change. With little more, little to no mental or emotional effects. And they understand that mistakes are part of the process. And so they don't see mistakes or failures as such a bad thing. They see the mistakes or the quote unquote failure as more as opportunities for learning and growing. Ultimately, when we were younger, the way we learned to walk and the way we learned to ride a bike and the way we learned to, to do a lot of things is by making a quote unquote mistake, by falling. So mistakes are just part of the process of learning and growing. And mistakes are part of what can happen in changing times. Much of who you see today in my own life is by my mistakes, by my wrong turns. So I thought, well, what I've come to appreciate and realize is that I've never made a wrong because everything has gotten me where I am today. When you can accept that and appreciate that, you learn how to grow and make opportunities from what you would once see as a wrong turn. The next trait is confidence. An optimist has optimism as the view and the faith that things will work out. Confidence is to believe and trust in your own ability to make it work. The I can. People who have a high confidence level, they often have a pretty good self-esteem as well. And they believe and trust that they can make any situation work out for them. The confident person, however, you have to be mindful that you don't come across to others as too arrogant or too bossy. Because that can interfere with relationships with other people. So you want to be confident, but you don't want to boast it too much with the people around you. Otherwise, you're going to probably end up pushing more people away than having people join your circle, so to speak. The next trait, and this is a big one for a lot of people in change, is the tolerance for ambiguity. One certainty surrounding change is that it will always create a level of uncertainty. Without a healthy tolerance for ambiguity, change is not only uncomfortable, it can be darn right scary and paralyzing for many. Tony Robbins, the self-help guru, said a number of years ago, the quality of your life is in direct proportion to the amount of uncertainty you can live with. The more uncertainty you can tolerate, the greater the quality of your life. Many people I see with depression and anxiety, and anxiety is becoming more prevalent these days for various reasons. One of the main reasons they're struggling with that depression and, and, and anxiety is related to the inability to cope and adapt to change, the struggle with dealing with the uncertainty. They want to know. Our ego is very much about uh, outcome oriented. Your soul, your higher self is more process oriented. When you are in your process, the outcome will take care of itself. 
And the GPS we use in our car teaches that, shows us that, because we plug in the destination, the GPS finds us, and then it lets go of the, the destination, kind of puts it in the back burner. And now it's going to focus on just mile by mile. And then when you're a mile from your destination, it pops back up and it says, yada, yada, a mile on your right. That's the, probably the best way to operate in life is to know your outcome. Yes, have that in mind. But once you have that in mind, then focus on your process step by step, knowing that that process will take you, lead you to the outcome. The last trait is patience or drive, or excuse me, passion and drive. Passion is one's level of intensity and determination to make something happen. And passion is the fuel that max maximizes these other six traits. And with drive, nothing seems impossible. Without passion or drive, change is very fearful and darn right exhausting. If one struggles with accepting and working any of these traits, they will likely struggle with depression and or anxiety. So I'd like you to close your eyes for a moment. And just take a few deep breaths. And first of all, I'd like you to just, in your mind's eye, just picture a mountain. It could be a mountain scene you've seen. And so just bring a mountain into your awareness. And notice the confidence how strong and resilient that mountain stands. It never wavers. It's always there. It's very steadfast, very committed and determined. And if you would now just shift your focus from that mountain and now notice water, perhaps in a flowing stream. And just call to your awareness, water flowing. And just notice its movement and how it weaves and flows around curves, around logs, over around rocks. And just notice its flexibility and its adaptability and how it flows because it wants to get to the ocean. And it might be stopped just very temporarily, but it finds a way to get going again. And wherever there's mountain, there's, a, there's water in nature. In fact, water is part of what makes the mountain. So both the mountain and the water know how to be with each other. They know how to fl flow and adapt and be strong and true with each other. And one really doesn't interfere or try to overpower or overtake the other. So in life, picture that mountain, that you are that mountain, strong, resilient, confident, and picture yourself being that water. I flow, I adapt, I adjust so I can flow home to my soul essence and the love and the goodness that I am. When you're ready, you may open your eyes and just stay true to that mountain and that water. You stand like a mountain, you flow like water. That will be very important in these exciting, challenging, and higher dimensional times we're moving to. Amen.
Thank you, David. My Eight pleasure. Seven, seven traits of change and its abundance of things sure. happening both today around the globe and even in our own neighborhoods and within our own families as well. Um, nice tips to take on the, our everydays in this time of change. For those folks that are going through changes and they don't understand what it is, what, what is your thoughts of, of helping those folks that uh, are aware of the changes but don't know how to deal with it? I mean, do you kind of have seven traits of change that, that you went through with us today? Or um, what's, what's just a kind, loving, humble word that you could, or words that you could share with those folks? You know, I mean, news, for example, and it's, it's all over the place, abundance of change uh, in our own workplaces, our own families as well. So uh, please share with the group tonight, if you could, just a, a few words of comfort uh, of helping people and those folks, each and every one of us, uh, deal with the traits of the changes that they're going through. Um, well, the seven traits naturally are a big part of the equation, but um, the first part of change is to accept whatever that change is. Uh, because what you resist will persist. What you accept, you begin to conquer and move forward from. Um, so an acceptance is a pivotal, there's something we're all charged with in our life more often now than ever, but um, acceptance is a big key. And I found that uh, people that have a lot of resistance to change, whatever it might be, any, anything from losing a, a loved one to losing a job or whatever, uh, even the whole COVID experience, we, we've been shaken up to waking up. Um, and it's been calling us to accept what is doesn't mean I like it or agree with it, but it is what it is. Um, and you saw the array of behaviors and such of people who were either accepting or resisting. And so, yeah, to me, the, the, the first key element is, is acceptance. Good question. Thank you. Thank you, David. Anyone else in the group have comments, questions for David tonight? Yeah, David, <laughs> can you hear me? Um, I, I really love the reminder about the uh, the three pigs and the big bad wolf story <clears throat> because now, well, one of the reasons, I do Course in Miracles every day, but I am also, for my second time, going through the way of mastery. <clears throat> and I just started the way of transformation today. <laughs> and... Um, and doing it very slowly. I'm rereading the pages three times before I go on to the next one or two pages. And it's, it's really remarkable um, how much, yeah, transformation is a good word. <laughs> so we'll see. Anyways, it's, it's great. Thanks for the reminder about all of that. Yeah. And uh, I appreciate your, your comment, Lloyd. And it, you made a key phrase there. You're reading it again. Uh, many of these texts, you have to read it many, many times. And each time you read it, you pick up something new or whatever. And yes, it is important to be patient and read it slow. Uh, so you can really digest it. Yeah. So, and that's a struggle for a lot of people because when we read a book, we want to, you know, race through it. But yeah, to just one page a day is enough sometimes. Um, because yes, they, they are just loaded with, uh, ways to be in life and you're learning from the master in, in eloquent ways and very truthful ways. So I appreciate that comment. You're not alone. Trust me. <laughs> David. Yes. I this is Ginger. Um, I'm struggling a little bit with this. I'm a clinical social worker. 
and I work in OB. And yet there's a lot of discussion today in today's world about the masculine approach to problem solving or management versus a feminine approach because men and women, according to neuroscience, think differently. Or it may be our orientation um, in problem solving. So when I hear certain traits here, they seem very masculine to me. So how is it that you work with the feminine brain? Yeah. Okay, wonderful question. So stand like a mountain is the masculine. Flow like water is the feminine. So these seven traits combine a little bit of both the masculine and the feminine. Uh, the other thing that's happening in the world today and think cycle, think of that 26,000 year cycle. If you divide it into five increments of approximately 5,200 years at a, at a crack, in the world we've been feminine, masculine, feminine, and we've been in the masculine for the last 5,000 plus years. Now this next era is both. It's not going to be either or. It will be the balance of the masculine and the feminine. And we will be more heart and head balanced, more thinking and feeling and intuition balanced rather than just logic. Okay? So... Um, these seven traits, they have aspects. I would encourage you to kind of see the feminine qualities of adaptability and adventurous and the tolerance for ambiguity and the passion. Both the masculine and the feminine will do it a little differently, yes. But they, all these elements are blended into these, both of those elements are blended into these uh, seven traits. And, and an easy way, just think of the water being the feminine and the mountain being the masculine. And in nature, it's always showing us how the feminine and the masculine are weaving in and out with each other. There's not that tug of war and that power over, or power under kind of dynamic. It's more power with. And uh, the more people reconcile their own shadow and ego wounds, the more they will begin to open up their heart center more and not be so in their logic sense. And by the way, when you said a clinical social worker uh, everything I learned in school on the clinical level, I don't use anymore <laughs> because it's very, it doesn't work. It never really has. Um, and yeah, so, and that's part of the new energies that we're, you know, I don't diagnose people per se uh, because I don't need to label you. If I label you, then I'm, I'm creating something that you're not. Um, and, and that's putting a, a barrier between you and me. So I just see you for who you are and work from there. Knowing that you can do it differently because you created your life as it is. And if you created that through your thoughts and your perceptions and your beliefs, you can recreate something different. But you have to work at it. You have to commit to it. And you have to just realize it won't happen overnight because it didn't get here overnight. So it's not going to change overnight. And so hopefully that helps answer the question a little bit. Yeah, looking at the balance of the opposites. And yeah, yes. Sometimes it, it, sometimes it can come, but there's a very narrow field to achieve that balance. Um, okay. And the creativity in clinical work, uh, when when uh, some people want to hold on to the old ways instead of thinking yes. about the wholeness of the person in their environment 
and all right. kinds of things. It's just different. Yeah. Yeah. The key is to be able to see the opposites, not so much as opposites, but they're your teacher and your opportunity. They're not your threat or your enemy. And so uh, can I hold the tension of the opposites? Exactly. Yeah. Can I hold that tension without needing to, to change it, knowing that it's my teacher and I'm, you're teaching me and I'm teaching you. And we both have a little bit of what the other needs. But as long as I see you as the threat or the enemy and I need you to do it on my terms and my way, <coughs> there's conflict. And there's, you know, I dug in my heels and now it's not love, it's fear and it's control and need for power over. And it's much more, un, it's more, much more conditional than unconditional. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of anger in women these days because of what has happened um, in the last year, I guess, or six years. Oh, yeah. 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 But the, the Supreme Court did the world or did our country a big favor with banning abortions because now that's rallied the troops if you will uh both men and women are kind of uh you know coming out of it and saying no this is totally wrong and so you watch what happens in this next election cycle in these next in between november of this year and in 24 there's going to be a major revolt in a in a very hopefully peaceful way uh, by because the women are going to come out in masses as well as uh, a fair amount of men. Um, Christianity is losing its momentum, believe it or not. Little by little, the numbers are getting less and less. You have to remember it's going to be the younger generation especially the grand, our grandchildren that are going to really show us the way because they're not coming in with this stuff anymore. They're not going to allow this division and power game anymore. Um, so there's a lot of neat things happening, not just in our society, but around the world. Um, because the old energies, they're just, they're not going to be able to sustain themselves. And so you just have to keep the keep the faith and and stay true to this new and more loving and peaceful reality that's on its way in. But chaos is uncertain order. So whenever there's change, there's there's going to be a level of chaos for some people. Uh, but like I said, chaos is uncertain order. Within the chaos, order is manifesting little by little. Well, I said I said to somebody the other day that the and and having come from the South in growing years, when I was really um, in in desert race, kind of in desert, and then moved to the hills of Tennessee, and, and there's the archetype of the Southern female is changing, mm -hmm. and it's. Um, it's just changing. It's it's not particularly serviceable anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of it, we just have to be patient. Uh, it has to play itself out. Okay. Focus on the process, knowing that that will create the outcome. Uh, but yes, we, we it requires patience. <laughs> so I have just a, a couple of things. Um, one is that it feels really good, David, uh, when you said, and I've heard other people say it, that these next generations didn't fall on the wheel of karma and they don't have this stuff coming. And I just feel like time to pass the baton. It's the world they're going to live in. Hopefully they won't forget us along the way because some of us are still going to be here. But, um, but y you know, it's, it's their ball game now. But the um, and I like to say um, one of LJ's favorite sayings with grace and ease. Yeah. You know, we don't have to think of all of this as hard work and struggle, and you know, oh, I think that's old thinking. Yeah. And the more you accept, that's where acceptance comes back into the picture. The more you accept 
that will naturally take you into that grace and ease. Mm -hmm. um, and then within that, to have a level of compassion and forgiveness, both for those who are struggling and, and still resisting. Um, as Jesus said, you know, forgive them for they not know what they do. Right. Everybody's doing the best they know how, given their level of consciousness and awareness. And inner, you know, how many people have really reconciled their own stuff. Um, and the more you can understand that and, and appreciate that and accept that, that we're all at different stages and, and levels of readiness and awareness. Um, and just realize that that's part of why people are doing some of the things they're doing or not. And we're all at different stages of readiness and awareness. I was just uh, a while back, I was given a link to two different at uh, two different times to two different people. One was Natalie Sudman on a near death experience. And the other one was a guy I can't remember his name right now, but his was before um, he came in. He was part of like the council that planning his life. And basically what they were both saying is that there's no wrongdoing and right doing. It's just what you chose to experience. You chose to do it. Right. And um, and when you get to the other side, there's no punishment. There's no it's just you just did it. Even if you were a mean SOB or a very kind, compassionate person, it doesn't matter. Right. That's what you chose to do. And that's just the way it is. And so I came out of those talks thinking you know when uh, when Dor uh was it dorothy said toto i don't think we're in kansas anymore i'm thinking i don't think i believe in karma anymore not the way i've always believed it. i don't know if everybody else thinks but i always thought of it as it, yes it's a balancing but it's kind of a punishment too yeah so to add on that think of all the things in life from early on to present day that you've made true you think when you were a young child and, and the things you made true from what you heard from your parents and society and whatever, your teachers. And think of how later on you said, well, that that's not quite it. That's not right. That's mm -hmm. not really true anymore. So to me, the distinction of what's true and what's the truth, what's true will change over the course of time. What is the truth will never be dictated by time. It will always remember. And there is an ancient truth, and ACIM expresses it. There is an ancient truth in our heart. This part of us, not up here, but in the heart. And in that text, what, they're mean, what they mean by ancient is it never wavers. It's, it's not consumed by time. It doesn't lose that truth in time. It's, I've always, kind of gotten, it's everlasting. I've kind of gotten into the habit of saying what I believe right now or what seems to be true right now because I believe completely differently than I did yep. You know, years ago and years before that and years before that, it's like it changes all the time. So be open to what I'm believing right now is maybe not being true yeah. for me at some yeah. point in the future because my perception changes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we're always that that what we made true is is always going to be in flux. Yeah. But what's true, what's the truth is always consistent. Mm hmm. I yep. think of the movie the way we were. Ah, uh, yeah. With Robert Redford and Barbara Streisand. Mm -hmm. She's at a point. I can only point. see the top of your head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get it into here. I can't, you know. <laughs> I said it reminds me of the movie the way we were at different points in 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 my life. I see something differently from the perspective of where I am mm -hmm. and what experiences I've had yeah. that have helped change my view. Yeah. And that's the biggest key when you change your thoughts, like that passage Therese read in the way of mastery, when you change your thoughts, you change your perceptions, you change your belief, you change your world. 
even though the world is still doing what the world's doing. And that's the power of changing from the inside out rather than wanting wanting everybody and everything to adapt and adjust to me. And to me, that's our true power is, is changing from the inside out. But what, one thing you did not mention in, in this talk was feel, the feeling of deserving the good. Um, I used to feel that I wasn't deserving of all the good that others had. And now, having been a part of the spiritual community, I realize that God wants only good for every one of us, um, whether you call it God or, or spirit or life or whatever we want to call it, but it's made a difference in realizing that, you know, these changes are, are changes that are waiting to be given, granted. Um, no. and, and this is something that in the past I would never have even thought of. But it's another dimension to what yeah. you were saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. There's an example of what you made true early on mm -hmm. and what you've discovered is more of a truth now. Yeah, that's Sometimes. my own worthiness. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes love is, in love is including. Too. Love is including. Yeah. And it's yes. important. The most important person to include in that love is ourselves. And I have no business in judging another person saying that they don't deserve this because they do. They're just as deserving as yep. I am. Yep. And any person, um, like you said before, the role that they play, um, that's their role in this in this life. Yeah. They, they may be acting like a complete idiot or something, but that that's because that's <laughs> what's needed for some reason for the learning of themselves and others around them and mm -hmm. and it took me a while to figure that one out too that i can't judge other people um just like i don't want them to judge me very true thank you yeah sometimes we don't see the good in what's happening in the moment we're we're in into reaction and we're going what you know <laughs> and we don't see the good sometimes till many many years down the road yeah. Yeah. And that's not right or wrong, good or bad. Sometimes we, we're just not ready in that moment to to see it or hear it or embrace it. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of clients I see when they start making progress and they're like, well, why didn't I do this, you know, 10 years ago? And I'm like, you weren't ready, you know, um, and just focus on that. You're, the fact that you're getting it now, that, it, that in the now you're doing it, because that's the only thing you got is what you do now. What you did 10, five years ago is gone. What you're going to do 10 years, five, you know, into the future is yet to be. The fact that you're doing it now, that's what matters. So just celebrate that. Yeah. Good question, by the way. Thank you. Good feedback. Thank you for your presentation, David. Yes, thank you for the presentation. Thanks. Great job, David. Yeah.